Call the meeting to order, uh, 6.02 p.m. Uh, is, this, is this our first meeting of 2022? Yes. Wow. Happy New Year, everybody. Um, okay. Uh, I would um, uh, entertain a motion to approve minutes for both December 1st, 2021 December 8, 2021, and December 22nd, 2021, unless anyone has any amendments to offer or corrections. Okay, I move that we accept the minutes of all three December meetings. Second. All those in favor, Joyce? Aye. Fred? Aye. Me, yes. Unanimous. Uh, vendor and payroll warrant warrants have been signed unless someone has a beat with them, but they've been signed. So I don't know how, anyway. <laughs> um, public comment. Does anybody have any comments that are not listed on the agenda already? Hearing none, we will move on. Scheduled appointments. Uh, we have Dick Evans here from Toro Verde to discuss the uh, marijuana retail establishment at 424 State Road and to request a renewal of the host community agreement. And I look forward to hearing about the visit that uh, took place earlier today. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, good to see you again. I'm joined tonight by uh, Billy Beats, the president of Toro Verde, and uh, their attorney, uh, David Ullian from uh, Vicente Cedarburg in Boston, who's with us. The uh, host community agreement that, that Toro Verde signed with uh, the town most recently uh, provides that it lapses unless um, uh, the applicant has obtained a final license from the CCC within 18 months. That 18 months expires at the end of this month. Uh, the status of the, of, the, of the enterprise right now is that the Toro Verde hopes the, uh, the store will open this spring or summer. Uh, and uh, so we're here tonight, everything's going forward. They've made a big investment in the facility there and they're asking the board to extend the date at which the host community agreement lapses from the end of this month to the end of this year, to the end of January, by which time we're confident the company will be up and operating. I'd invite Billy or David to respond to any questions you may have. My only observation is, and it makes all the sense in the world to request this extension because of the uh, the amount of time it's taken to to open your doors. Um, I, I can't help but wonder whether it makes sense to extend it to the end of 2023 um, so that it doesn't lapse and, and you've got the better part of 18 months under your belt before it lapses and we and we have uh, further conversations. Joyce is our resident expert on on the agreement, so I will defer to her, but it mm. it strikes me that I, I think we all assumed that it would that, that this would would uh, would be up and running before now. So I, I, I think that 2023, December 2023 would be more in, in line with our original timeline than December 2022. But Mm. That's my, that's my. Right. Well, certainly, I don't think we'd have any objection to 2023. Hopefully we won't need it, but I don't see any problem with, with yeah. that date. Um, yeah, I, I was looking through here because there's also a, a sort of a five-year time frame. Um, and I was trying, I was looking through there trying to see, I'm trying to remember exactly where the five, the five-year clock starts ticking. Is that like once you start or is that, because we've had some that, lapsed after five years because they, the state has been so slow on things. Well, this um, is a five-year agreement and it commences uh, July 31st of 2020. Okay. So it's not, so, um, right. It's good to, so, um, I, I think let's let it go till the end of the year. Like this is still one year at a time. That seems, uh, it seems reasonable. It's not like we're not going to help extend it if it if it goes further than that. Um, I just know at the end of that five years we have to kind of renegotiate this, and that's uh, um, you know it's likely to, to mostly stay as it is. It's been a pretty strong 
um, agreement. Everybody else who has facilities in town are going by the same um, agreement. Um, am I missing something, Brian? Do you think? Yeah. So extending it to- I don't think so. What, so extending, there's a clause three under time. the now therefore. Um, there's one to the third piece. We'd be extending clause three for an additional that's year. Right. That's right, to the end of this year. That's what we're yeah. asking. Right. And, and so that, that extension does not impact the five-year time frame at all. Yeah, that's I don't correct. think it, that's, that's oh, what I, I wanted to- I thought it would push everything Right, that's what I was checking for, and I, I think um, he's correct that it's, um, you know, this agreement started on a date, and in five years from that date, we have to keep talking about it. And in some cases, people came back to us after five years, and they still hadn't gotten through to the CCC and that's on the state level. So yeah, that, that's the um, way I read it. But the, it's a five-year agreement, and this is just one right. element of that five-year agreement. Okay. Yeah. So perhaps um, a reasonable motion would be to uh, amend uh, the uh, host community agreement clause three uh, to instead of within 18 months from the effective date of the agreement till the end of calendar year 2022. I will second that. All those in favor, Joyce? Aye. Fred? Hi. Me, yes. Motion carried unanimous. Thank you all very much. Okay, thanks you guys. Appreciate Thank your you. time. Thanks for Thank coming you. out today. Thank you. All right. Um, COVID-19, Brian, you want to take this? Yep. Uh, let me share my screen here. So as everybody knows, the um, well, I assume everybody knows that the CDC and as and they were adopted by MassDPH um, changed um, their guidelines for isolation and quarantine. Um, and we wanted to uh, reflect that in our return to work policy in terms of how uh, folks come back to work, either how they if they've been if it's been an, an exposure to COVID-19 or there's actually been a COVID-19 positive testing, uh, COVID-19 test. Um, and really what we're doing here, and I, I ran these by um, Fran Fortino and the Board of Health, um, we're essentially uh, referencing the uh, mass DPH guidelines for exposures and also for, um, and also for, for employees who test positive for COVID-19. The Board of Health is really insisting that for um, a positive uh, COVID-19 test, that if the employee were to come back to work between um, essentially day five and day 10, that they would like there to be a negative antigen test um, as some indication that the employee is less infectious. Um, that's sort of been a debate going on in I think between experts as to whether there should be a test out provision. Some countries have it, some don't. Um, so what the proposed what, what's what's written here is that uh, if employees come back to work or are able to come back to work between day five and essentially um, day ten, they would need to have a negative antigen test. Um, employees um, do not need to test out if they're coming back on let's say the eleventh day after the isolation period ends. Um, um, so we're just trying to keep me, up Brian, with which which email is this document in? Um, this was sent out today. Today, okay. Yeah, I there was we... waiting to get comments back from from the board of health before I sent it out. Okay. Well, I mean, getting the antigen tests is a relatively easy task these days. Um, those are the rapid tests, right? Oh, those are the rapid. Those aren't even the. I'm sorry, I, I was confusing them. I thought they were the ones that you pick up at UMass that are readily available. Those are more readily available than rapid tests are these days. Um. Yeah. You know, that's I, probably going to change in a few weeks. But yeah. Yeah. The, the, the federal program will yeah. kick, be kicking in. 
Right. The, 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 the volume of the UMass tests won't diminish. The, the volume of the rapid test will, are, is going to increase, right? I, I get that. Right, and the PCR tests are uh, generally have a higher accuracy rate, but they take usually 24 to 48 hours to get your results. Mine was 24, so, yeah. Right, um, but yeah, so it'll depend um, a bit on even the weather, right? Um, um, if there's bad weather and if they have trouble transporting things to the laboratories, then it's sometimes 48 and then only in one case for me has it ever been more than 48 hours. Right. So never, yeah. I don't think we have to specify which test necessarily. Um, no, I, I would think for cost purposes, Joyce, I, I don't want people to incur, and unless the town's gonna pay for, if, if someone has to purchase a rapid test, you know, I, mm. I'm thinking of people's wallets. So I, if I could just add a couple things. So. Uh, the Board of Health recently just received um, 160 antigen tests that they're making that they're making available to employees um, for return to work um, at, at a minimum, and I'm not sure what else they're going to do with that. Um, and they also, um, according to Mike Archibald from the Board of Health, the PCR tests are are really sensitive. So the, you can, people can actually test positive on a PCR test weeks after their infectious period mm -hmm. ends. Yeah. So the, the yeah. Board of Health's recommendation was, I had originally had antigen or PCR test here and they wanted us, they wanted me to strike out the, the PCR test because it's, it's, according to them, it's too mm -hmm. sensitive and it, it doesn't line up with oh. someone's you infectious going period. Test, so You're gonna test positive for a long time after you are yeah. initially positive. That's just the way it goes, you are, yeah. Yeah. So that, that I you reminded me of that. And, and actually, I, I knew that and I'm not um, I would uh, my, my son's girlfriend is a medical student. And uh, we discussed this over Christmas. So now I'm remembering that. Right. And um, that the PC uh, the people who who test positive don't take another PCR test for three months, even in the Smith College testing program, you don't have to go in because those are all PCR tests for for three months. Right, that's true at Amherst as well. Yeah, so that, that, that makes perfect sense. I, 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 should, have, I should have remembered that. I, I, thought, I thought it was regardless of what test that you're gonna be positive. Mm. I, I'm um, off the I, I think we, we, we I'm, I'm fine with what the, the Board of Health is recommending personally. Yeah, I don't see any reason to to do something different than what they're suggesting. I see no reason Especially to do Especially if we've different. got the tests available to, to give to people. 180 right. seems like a lot. We don't have anywhere near that many employees. <coughs> and uh, But I, I imagine they also have some other uses for those. <laughs> well, you know, and the reality is though that we have to remember that it is cold and flu season. And, it, and you're gonna be testing and, and, and you, very easily could test negative just because you happen to catch a cold. Mm -hmm. um, but we have to be diligent. Yeah. And um, can I just um, uh, clarify one thing? My understanding of the CDC recommendation was that if you're symptom free, it's like the earliest you can return is five days with the negative antigen test. Is that right? So yeah. if someone has symptoms, then they're clearly, that's a different thing, right? And I think yeah, that's I already true in our in our policy. Right. Yeah, up on the top there. Yeah. Fred, you got anything? No, no, I'm good going with this as proposed. Okay, motion. I move we adopt the proposal from the Board of Health with their language. I'll second that. All those in favor, Fred? Aye. Joyce? Aye. Me, yes. Motion carries. Uh, I've got to go to my agenda because Brian blocked it. <laughs> um, extended payment plan program to support income qualified residents impacted by the merger of the- American Rescue Park. Plan Act funds? I'm sorry? 6A. Rescue Plan Act, 6A. Oh, did I? I'm sorry. American Rescue Plan. I apologize. 
Um, immediate use of America, Re America Rescue Plan Act funds in response to ongoing pandemic. Response costs versus recovery costs. Brian, this would be you. Yep. Um, so it occurred to me that when I was going back and forth with Fran about, about how we're going to um, obtain tests when the, when the Omicron was surging um, and before the federal government made the decision to make them available to everybody, um, it occurred to me that we have all this money sitting in an account. Um, and if we would have talked about it two months ago, we wouldn't have, we would have probably been more focused on recovery than we would have in, in terms of response. Um, and it, it sort of occurred to me that if there was a need to purchase um, N95 masks or additional tests or um, other types of PPE or anything else like that, um, this money is sitting in an account and it really needs to be, um, mm -hmm. it's treated as essentially grant money. So it's under the discretion of the select board to spend it. Um, so I was thinking it, it would probably make sense if we just put, I don't know, the select board voted to maybe put $5,000, you know, just have a motion, have a vote on the book saying that that amount can be spent on um, response costs for things like PPE or tests so that if these opportunities do come up and it's, you know, a week and a half before a meeting that it's just something that can, that we can go ahead and purchase. Mm -hmm. and that would be primarily at your discretion, Brian, right? It could be at mine or it could be at mine in the chairs. I'm sure Jonathan would love to be involved. <laughs> <laughs> just aching. <laughs> I, I think we can put it at Brian's discretion just to be yeah. able to make quick decisions. Yeah. yeah. And um, one thing I, I like about Brian is he's generally, he gives us a heads up on a lot of things. Yeah. So, and so if he says, yeah, I'm going to go spend a bunch of that money on N95 masks, then I, I'm sure we will get an email and we'll be in the loop. And if there's anything objectionable, we can, we can object. Yeah, how about if we just say if one of us sees an email or a decision that Brian's making that we that we that we consider individually a a, a, a gaffe, that um, if if somebody voices a, a concern that that Brian will um, slow his pace, and we will discuss it at a at the next board meeting as a group. Okay, and that doesn't break open meeting a lot because. It's as an individual, not as a deliberative group. Correct. Okay. Right. right. And just respond individually. Don't re don't reply off. So okay. So I'll, I um do I hear a motion to reflect what I just said? Oh. Well, we need a motion first to approve the the fund, mm -hmm. the the use mm -hmm. of the money for re uh, five thousand dollars for a response. Okay. Uh, as a quick no. response fund. I'm willing to give it a try. <laughs> uh, I move that we uh, allocate $5,000 of these uh, recovery and response funds for discretionary purchases related to response and recovery at the discretion of the town administrator uh, with the uh, caveat that he will keep the select board informed. I will second that with, with the amendment that if one of the select board members has a difference of opinion that he won't take action until we can meet as a board to discuss uh, in, in public open meeting. Well, how, how about just it, any expenditures from the fund will be disclosed to the board at or before the next board meeting? Yeah, but, but my point is, is that Fred is that he shouldn't need to wait for the next board meeting to take those steps. So if he's going to take the steps and he, and he hears from one of us saying, oh, I don't know about this, this should be discussed, then he doesn't take that step. Otherwise, he can go ahead and spend money before the next board meeting. So I'm trying to expedite it unless somebody has a beef. Well, no, I'm saying that he can, that has the authority to spend the money. Let us know what it's being spent yeah. on. If there's a problem... Problem. We should discuss any expenditures. No, but but I think the point is is that 
he he needs authority to spend the money more more rapidly perhaps than our next meeting yeah. so if yeah. he hears no um, I'm, I'm not saying we need to give approval and it's more ratifying after the fact yeah but 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 again the money will have been spent right but there's a limit of five thousand dollars right on this and um i think any um if we put something on there where like he has to wait to hear from all three of us that we individually don't have a problem with it that's going to delay things i, I, and yeah, no, I, think, I don't that think that having wait, the, wait for us that this all. is a five thousand dollar limit i think is i'm willing to trust that much and um if he really really is unsure of something i'm sure he will <laughs> that has been his practice to um check in with us and say hey do you think this is what well, uh, I mean, the board was thinking at the time Oh, so. okay. I, okay. I, 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 I'm, I'm giving, I'm giving cover to Brian is what I'm trying to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But, you know, mm -hmm. I'll hear a motion. Oh, I think I gave a motion. Oh, you gave and a motion. I think I seconded it. All those in favor, Joyce. Aye. Fred? Aye. I will abstain. OK. Um, income qualified residents in the Whitley Water District and Water Department merger, Brian. Yep. I'm going to share my screen real quick. Not so quick. So we talked a while back about, and this goes back to discussions that we had when we were talking about the water merger um, and how it was going to be funded. And I think it was Jonathan who brought up the idea of trying to help out if folks were going to have a problem paying the, the $5,000 hookup fee that's being required um, by the water commissioners to hook into the system. Um, and we had discussions about setting up, uh, you know, some type of plan for those residents. There was discussion about, well, if we, if we set it up for the residents in the center town, whether it should be extended to other folks who couldn't hook up to the system in other parts of town and then it, it sort of drifted over into well can we set up something that that helps people who are on private wells um this right here just really addresses that first category um it's a little bit it's a little bit setting up a program that that would deal with with private wells is is much more detailed and will take a lot more time i think um and i think this could also be modified at a later date um, if the water commissioners wanted to do that to to extend to people outside of um, outside of the center. But this program right here is is really just um, for the people in center in the center of town. Um, and what the water commissioners would like to do is like they'd like to send out the mail a mailing soon that has a letter updating the folks that will be affected by the merger. Um, it'll have the water agreement that a uh, resident signed to um, sign up to receive water from the water department. Um, and then I'm also proposing that it has a, uh, a half page sort of mailing insert that says, hey, um, the select board, if, it's, if this is approved tonight um, for income qualified residents and there's the, there's the income eligibility limits on it that say, hey, if, if you qualify for one of these, um, you can apply for what's what I'm terming an extended payment plan, um, and that would break up the the five thousand dollar hookup fee into four payments over a, a two year period. Um, and it this way it's a little bit easier as a to administer it because it would it would just be an, a charge um, on four water bills, and um, that's really about it. So what it would require is obviously, let's say we get, um, you know, two applications. The, the time that the one-year note 
for constructing the system comes due, um, obviously that, that amount of money is going to be short, right? Um, we're not going to have collected the full amount. So this essentially needs a funding source for um, a two-year period. Um, and really the one that kind of sticks out, and I don't want to spend all of our ARPA money, but um, that's really the one that kind of sticks out. And really there's two eligibility categories. One is um, investments in, in, in water infrastructure, and the other one is to is to help those impacted by, you know, economically uh, by COVID-19. So um, we'd essentially be, if, you know, we'd essentially be borrowing the money from ARPA because we would get the money back in theory at the end of the two-year period. And um, the money could be put back into the, you know, into that account. Um, but it essentially allows folks to not have to come up with $5,000 by September of this year. Um, I'll, I'll kick off some thoughts. Um, I, I wish that we could extend it to, uh, eight quarters as opposed to four for people. There are people who may still have a challenge coming up with 1250 a quarter. Um, and there's no, there's nothing here that states what those people do if they can't come up with the money. Um, so I would, I would, I would pose that as a question. I would also, um, I, I know that I'm, that I'm speaking to a, 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 a very small audience when I say that I, I, I think that the town should still be, <clears throat> um, helping out the people who are, um, hooking up that, um, you know, the, 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 the town helped out when the water system was created to begin with, and the town should be helping out as a, as a whole here. Um, and then finally, I think that rather than dipping into ARPA money, I think we should be, um, borrowing from free cash as opposed to ARPA, ARPA money. That's just my, this is not COVID related. This is something that we need to do. Um, and I, you know, I, I, I just think we're, we're a community and we're not acting like one sometimes. Is, would borrowing from free cash or paying with, out of free cash be a more cumbersome process would that involve going to a special town meeting for approval? Uh, you know- Whereas I, borrowing from the ARPA money could be done immediately. Well, but we have time, I think now. It's not like this is gonna happen tomorrow. We could have, and, and, and I, I got to believe we're due for a special time meeting at some point. Maybe not, but I don't think we should let bureaucracy or administrative minutiae get in the way of doing what I consider to be the right thing. Now, other but, people may, may disagree, but. At this point, we don't know how much money we're even talking about. No, we don't. We have no idea. Yeah. My guess is it's not a tremendous amount, but we don't know. Yeah. And some energy number times 5,000. Which would make it harder to go to town meeting without a specific number well but we do that sometimes anyway we say you know not to exceed that's pretty standard hmm. well i think we can't i mean we won't know until we send this out how many people there might be applying for it so it's not like we can have a town meeting before we know um i guess i'm i have less of a problem using arpa money on this than jonathan um well i, I mean i don't disagree I, I if it came from free cash i wouldn't lose any sleep over that but um i think we, if we're allowed to spend it on inf water infrastructure then i think we should at least consider using the ARPA funds. The other thing I think I will no delay this using though, the, if the one ARPA of those funds. funds will delay it. And it sounds like it might be delayed if we have to wait for a town meeting or a special town meeting appropriation of free cash. Then it's certainly easier to go to the ARPA funds. And then maybe the easier thing isn't the right thing to do, but 
it certainly isn't an illegal thing to do. A town meeting vote would also give us a sense of the town. You know, and, and personally, yeah. I would have no issue rather than making someone go through the potentially awkward um, process of applying for assistance. I would just do across the board payments of 1250 for everybody who's 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 going through the, the merger. We're a town. We're one town. We're not two towns. We're not three towns. We're one town. So that sounds like you're saying take uh let's say by the time the note gets in they've only made one payment right that means everybody's only made one payment of 1250 that means yep. three quarters of that chunk of money we have to fund out of somewhere yep i think that's a lot bigger than i was thinking originally so i have to kind of wrap my head around that a little bit you're right Joyce. it is bigger there's there's no question it's bigger i mean and and I don't have any doubt that we're going to realize all that money back. Um, so, but the, but so something like 40 people, right? Yep. Or 40 hookups um, times uh, uh, 3750, uh, which is what they would not have paid. So that's $150,000 out of free cash. That's a lot. If it were two or three people, four or five people even, then that's, say it were five uh, times uh, 3750. That's about $20,000 mm -hmm. yeah. out of either free cash or, or ARPA funds. I, I get it, and 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 maybe I'm frustrated that we haven't, and maybe mm -hmm. I'm voicing frustration that, that 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 we aren't stepping up and helping right. people uh, across the board. Um, mm -hmm. But so I'm, you know, if 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 we just want to do it with the people who apply, I, I can live with that. I I do think it should be free cash, mm -hmm. but you know, I'll probably lose that battle, and I'm totally okay with that. I, I think it should just be the people who apply and I think our ARPA money is quicker and easier. I have no problem if it ends up being out of free cash either. I just think the process will be slower and, and um, we, we want to get problems. this done. Yeah, we, we do. we, I mean, I, I'd rather not wait for a town meeting to get this application out. Right. Okay. I, I, I can I can live with that. I I I just really am frustrated that 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 this town's not helping the people who need to 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 hook up. The town's not helping on it at all. It seems, and I'm frustrated with that. We helped out a lot a long time ago, and to the benefit the betterment of the town as a whole. Yeah, and and this has been a long conversation though, John, and the water yeah. commissioners. Yeah. We're really not in favor I know. of not having the I know. I, I, And I think they're so, wrong. You know, I, 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 I am also sensitive to the fact that people closer to it are advocating for this fee and that they have good reasons. And I don't pretend to uh, express them very well. Okay. I'd, I'd hear a motion. And before we do that, I've got one small administrative thing. Brian, on the form, on the, the table of income eligibility limits, yep. can you, on that form, sort of clarify whether those figures are the area medium income or the 80% of the area median income? Just, it's not 100% clear which yep. figure those are. Yeah, I can clarify that. Is is there an appetite to extending this to um, eight quarters as opposed to four for those people who apply? Last time I checked, if you're living within 100% of the poverty line, which is what this is, um, coming up with 1250 extra money in a given three month period of time is not necessarily an easy thing.
I, I have no problem extending it to eight quarters rather than four. I, I don't think it'll be a, a huge number of applicants. So we're not going to be talking about a massive amount of money. Right. I agree with that, Fred. Yeah. So then the, um, the agreement would be um, amended to say eight payments mm -hmm. of 625. And then that makes it instead of being paid over two years, right? Because there's two payments a year with your water bill, it'd be paid in four years. Am because, I, to, because of the division of implementation. No, because you have two water bills per year and you have make uh, two payments a year. Um, right, I'm sorry, and, right, okay. Right, yeah. so eight payments means four years yeah. of quote, borrowing from the ARPA money. Yeah. And I don't know how, I don't know how, we might drive our town treasurer collector completely crazy with this because the money will get paid to the water folks. The ARPA money would go to the water folks and then how does it get back to the ARPA fund? I don't know how to do that. I just assume that our account I, a separate account will have to be set up and the yeah, water yeah. department will have to pay 625 or 1250 whatever or, it is. yeah so yeah we we, you know, we into that yeah. fund now i, I also that, that's what we pay accountants for right i i also realize that something's gonna have to be set up um in the event that that uh, over that four-year period of time people move how does that how does that uh, impact um, the payment. I, I, I yeah, would love well, yeah, if, if, if it's longer, we, goal, yeah. that it would just get wrapped into the to the new mortgage and they would be paid in lump, in one lump sum. At the end, yeah. yeah. Well, probably well, need at, to add at closing, Joyce. Yeah, right. That that at closing, the the full fee has to get paid. I think yeah. that would have yeah. to be yeah. closing. Added. Water bills generally have to be paid up. And that, yeah. And this is part of the water bill. Right, not just the, just not, not just the biannual water bill, but the whole 5,000, whatever's left would have to be paid. Yeah. Right. Right. Right, so I think that has to be in there that if, if it, it, that wouldn't matter if it was two years or four years, honestly. No. Um, no. That uh, if, if residents changes hands, then this needs to be paid off as part of the closing or, well, I don't know what the right wording is for that, but that, I think that probably has to get in there anyway. And we just have to be sure that the water department's accounting system can cover the fact that the, that account owes money that is not yet due. Yeah. yeah. I would imagine that's pretty straightforward stuff. <laughs> I have no idea if it's straightforward. It should be. <laughs> but there but are people whether... smarter than me about accounting who can hopefully figure it out. And I hope they won't be really angry with us for making them do it this way. If they are, I'll never tell you. No, oh, all right. <laughs> At least not on a live TV, a public meeting kind of thing here. So, I have full faith that, that our account is capable of doing that. Okay. Who's gonna make that motion? I think Fred should. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe John, I'm not going to make the motion. I'll second it, but I'll, I'm not going to make the motion. I'll, I'll make the motion. I move we approve the extended payment plan program amended to four payments of six hundred twenty-five dollars each. Eight payments. Eight payments of four of uh, twelve hundred. Ah, eight payments of six hundred twenty-five dollars each, rather than the four payments of twelve fifty as spelled out in the. Uh, draft that we've been given uh, and that any uh, if his house or property is sold in the interim while money is still outstanding that that be paid on, on closing of that property it does not extend beyond that and that any monies that need to be fronted to cover late payments caused by this shall be covered, come out of ARPA funds. Okay, I'll second that. 
All those in favor, Fred? Aye. Joyce? Aye. Me, yep. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and Brian, make sure to clean up the, the chart. Just so. <laughs> oh, done. Thanks. All right. That's good. Uh, good compromise negotiation. All right. It's a shame that other people higher up can't see that. Best practice. Um, public comment letter H3821, an act creating a municipal and public safety building authority to include highway garages and DPW facilities as eligible municipal buildings under the proposed legislation. I assume by this it means that um, highway garages and DPW facilities are not currently considered municipal buildings. That's true. I, well, when I read the legislation, I, I emailed Natalie to ask if that question, if highway garages and DPW facilities were not included, and she said it's not in the language of the legislation. So, wow. I mean, that was my biggest concern, especially what, with what we're looking at with what I like to call the yellow elephant on uh -huh. Christian Lane. Um, are, 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 are fire and police stations considered municipal buildings? They're, they're explicitly called out, yeah. That's Municipal buildings and public, yep, police and fire. Oh. oh, yeah, public safety. Sorry, yeah, I apologize, yeah. All right. So what are we supposed to do here, Brian? Um, I, I'm suggesting that we submit a letter, and this is a draft of the letter. I also want your opinion. So, so they'll reimburse up to a million dollars, and, I mean, is that enough, I guess? Probably not, but... I don't know how to be too, I don't know what, how greedy is too greedy. <laughs> I don't think it's gonna fly if we say they should pay for 100% of our highway garage, but. Right, wasn't it 50% that, that, that um, up, up to a maximum? Up to a million. Of, right. Up to a million, yeah. And what's the estimate been on the highway garage? Has there been one? I think there has been. I think there's been sort of many. Yeah. yeah, I mean the ones around. I think what was Deerfield five million, six million, more. Maybe yeah. I'm totally off eight, on that. It was, but it was eight million, but that's quite a large building. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, it doesn't seem like it's going like a million as a limit will reach anywhere near fifty percent. So, I'm going to guess it'll reach about. 15, I, I would bet 15 to 20 million. I mean, 15 to 20%, I apologize. Right, right. No difference there. Yeah. So so the draft letter is saying, saying that we support it, but hey, you missed highway garages. Yeah. Okay, so what do we do? I mean, uh, is this a motionable? Right. So we're basically moved whether to sign this letter or not, and if we want to amend the letter. Yeah. Um, and I guess the amendment that Brian is hinting at is that do we want to push for a, a higher limit than a million dollars? I think it should be a percentage as opposed to a, 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 a flat fee. A flat sum. Well, they're saying a percentage up to a flat sum. Right. It's not a flat sum. It's a That's percentage fair. up to a flat That's sum. Fair. And that flat sum, in our opinion, it seems is pretty low. We probably are not the only people who would be pointing that out, that a million dollars is a little cheap. Yeah, I think a million dollars is low for us and would be much lower for a yeah, larger most community. towns aren't as small as we are. The vast right. majority of the communities in the state. Yeah. Um, I would say, I would amend it to 2 million personally. And we're not gonna be listened to, but I'd do that amendment anyway. Yeah, I'd rather urge 2 million than 1 million. That'll... You know, I, I'll do respect. I, I, I don't think that the legislature is going to stop in their tracks when Waitley makes an amendment and says two million dollars. They're gonna right. keep, keep moving forward and say Waitley who, but yeah, yeah. we 
we we have a neighbor that's currently asking for forty million. So, <laughs> I'm sorry, I shouldn't laugh. <clears throat> oh, Hatfield, come on. <laughs> All right, yeah. All right. Um, so, I I, I okay. would two million instead of one million at twenty five. You know. Okay. So I would yep. move that we sign this letter, uh, adding a sentence uh, that also urges our um, uh, the, that the limit be raised from a million to two million. Fred, you want to second it? Second. All those in favor, Joyce? Aye. Fred? Aye. Me, yes. You got that, Brian? Verbatim. All right. Changing that one to a two is tricky business sometimes. Um, could become a 12. Draft expressions of interest to be submitted to the Municipal Vulnerability Preparedness Program. That's me. Um, yeah. So, hi. Uh, hi. We finished up the uh, draft expressions of interest for submission to the Municipal Vulnerability Preparedness Program. Um, they center around uh, getting a solar battery and panel installation, um, and then various uh, permutations of culvert survey, uh, repair, and replacement. Um, I sent the uh, long answers for the um, expression of interest form. It's an online form, so it's kind of hard to show the actual like filled out form, um, but I can share my screen and show you. Oh, uh, one second, I actually need Brian to uh, enable screen sharing. Um, one second. There we go. Will happen. Okay, Hannah, give me just a minute. Okay, thank you. Um, so what I'm looking for from the select board is approval to submit these expressions of interest to the Municipal Vulnerability Preparedness Program so that we can get feedback on our ideas and eventually submit an actual application. Probably at the beginning of summer, they haven't released the official application due date yet. Um, I can pull up the long answers if you'd like to see them. They're long, so they might be kind of hard to read on the screen, but I'm... Right. Is, is it the same thing that's in our meeting materials? It should be. Yep. Yeah. Hannah, you should be all set now. <laughs> okay, great. Thank you. So I will share my screen. Okay. So um, this is what's in the meeting materials. It should look familiar. And hmm. then here is the expression of interest form that I'm going to copy paste those answers into. Mm, okay. do, do we actually know what a 63, um, I mean, oh, I've got it, sorry, it's behind the screen now. Um, <coughs> what a 63 kilowatt system would cost to install? Yes, so uh, we were provided with preliminary quotes. Yeah. Um, I'm actually gonna stop sharing my screen so that I can pull that up. Um, so the uh, 63 kilowatt system, just pulling up the quote really quickly, excuse me. Mm, sure, take your time. Thanks. Computer is loading. Okay, so I will share this quote that we received from Valley Solar. Can you see the investment outlook? Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So here's the gross system cost is 264,000 approximately. Um, after incentives, it'll be 219. Um, and then this shows the savings uh, after 25 years. Okay. And um, to get that um, amount of area, uh, I see the design render there of the roof of for Sandy Lane. 
Yes. Um, does it need, I would imagine it needs a little more area than that, or am I mistaken? This was actually the only design render that they showed us. I believe that everything will fit on the roof here. Oh, okay. That's interesting. I would have thought we would need something um, in the, like covering the parking lot area as I well, would, which I'm not opposed to. Yeah, no, I think in the future, I would love to see a parking lot solar cover, but um, that wasn't included in this quote. Okay. So Hannah, the question that I have, and again, mm -hmm. I'll be the first to admit, I have not been on top of our building that you guys are currently sitting in, but I would have assumed that that roof is not that clean and that there are other objects that are going to prevent us from having just a straight array like that, um, pipes and standards and things like that, exhaust systems. Maybe I'm wrong, but I'm, I, I will be shocked if there's not stuff up there that needs to be worked around. Um, I think it actually is a relatively clear um, okay. Great. space for us to put the panels up. Again, yeah. I haven't done a Google uh, Google Earth look right. at, but yeah, no, that's great if that's if that's the case. And it's a yeah. metal roof. Mm. Uh, mm. Sorry. Yeah, go ahead. It's a metal roof, so installation will be relatively easy. It's a lot better than if it were a slate roof, for example. Yeah. And I also was thinking that the, the angle of the roof line doesn't really set these as due south. So, I mean, maybe when, when it actually comes to doing it, we can talk about other options. But this is really just to see if we can get $264,000, if I remember the number from the yeah. previous slide. Um, yes. So that, you know, because the, the ground mounts that... Um, that track are now so much more efficient that it may be fewer panels. And if we've got the land out there to do that, that's also another, but it, that's too many details to try and get into here. So um, I, I think I, I didn't, I had no idea what order of magnitude was going to be. And $250,000 sounds like that's the order of magnitude for this. Yeah, and again, this isn't an actual application to MVP. This is just an expression of interest. So yeah. um, we're just so that's really- a, That's all we need to do there. Exactly, we're just asking if they think this is a good idea or not, and they'll tell us what they think. I think it's great. Yeah, I think, I it think is, it's, it's I like fantastic. That. Awesome, okay. And then um, the other, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen again. Um, the other expressions of interest have to do with uh, culvert survey and repair for the town. Um, I did a few various permutations to submit as expressions of interest because we can submit as many expressions as we want. Um, my hope is that it'll really be able to target into what MVP thinks is most competitive and they can return their thoughts to us um, with which idea they think will work best moving forward. Okay. Yeah. So what are, what are the, does anybody have any questions? What are the steps that we need to do, if anything, right now, other than nod our heads and say, looking forward to the next piece of information? We don't need to set priorities on these. We're just sending in expressions of interest right. for different projects, yep. okay? Good. Yeah, so these there's three different culvert related projects. Yes. One specific to River Road, um, one um, about survey and repair prioritization mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and the other culvert survey and replacement wait that sounds a lot like the culvert survey and replacement yeah culvert. so basically do I'm those sorry, overlap man. each other or something they do yeah so um what i'm thinking is that there's one that's primarily planning the repair prioritization model basically um, there's one that's the actual boots on the ground replacement or as close as we can get to it of a culvert oh. on River Road. And then the third idea is the combination of the two that would be a two year long project. Um, okay. I'm not sure if MVP will fund that or not, but that's why I'm submitting yeah. an expression of interest for it. Oh, okay. So if they decide, oh, we're not going to fund any replacements, but we'll fund a lot of planning, then maybe one of those gets in. Yeah. Um, the ones that, that actually have replacement in them may may not survive, but we don't want to put all our eggs in that basket. 
in case, but if they're saying, oh, we don't want to fund planning unless you're going to actually replace them, then we've got those in place. Right. Okay. Exactly. Understood. All right. Good. I think I'm done with my questions. Okay. I think it's all been covered for me. I think it's great. Um, awesome. Do we need a vote? Uh, yes, if uh, a vote would be great um, to submit the expressions okay. of interest. All right, um, I, I'll entertain a motion to uh, submit the expressions of interest on MVP. I'll second that. All those in favor, Joyce. Aye. Fred. Aye. Me, yes. Great. All right, good job, Hannah. Uh, I'm actually uh, up for the next one again. as well. Yep. <laughs> yes. For some reason, I lost my agenda again. We need to get you a bigger screen, John. Uh, maybe. Anyway, go ahead, Hannah. Okay, so um, we are also looking at the One Stop for Growth uh, grant program coming up. I will share my screen again. Uh -huh. Sure. Okay, so uh, here's the project development summary for One Stop for Growth. Um, right now, we're looking at a few different projects and a few different timelines for submission of these projects or uh, of these expressions of interest based on how many projects we want to pursue. Um, right now, if we're looking at pursuing only two projects, the expression of interests are due on March 18th. If we're submitting more than two projects, it's due by February 4th. Um, the projects that I'm thinking about are the creation of a master plan. Um, Waitley is working from numerous disparate planning efforts from over the years, um, many of which don't take into account current economic trends, especially with the pandemic. I think that it would be um, wise to create a general master plan that we can work from for the next 10 years or so. Um, additionally, uh, we last time submitted a uh, excuse me, an economic planning study for the exit 35 area. Um, I think that we could resubmit that. We could also bundle that into the economic planning part of the creation of a master plan. Um, and then third, uh, this was recommended by Keith, uh, the water main loop closure and paving of Egypt Road. Um, so what I'm looking for from the select board is um, basically approval to submit these expressions of interest. Um, I recognize that this deadline is before our next select board meeting. So if we choose to pursue more than two projects, um, I would need approval to actually write these expressions of interest and submit them before the next meeting. Are those in, are those in any particular order, Hannah? No, not necessarily. Because you're saying two of three are the... Did I misunderstand you? Yeah, so we could go about this um, in a couple of different ways. We could just focus on two projects, especially because I think that this, excuse me, this exit 35 economic planning study can be looped under the broader creation of a master plan. Um, or we could submit expressions of interest separately for all three of these different projects. It just affects the due date um, down here. How old is our master plan currently? Uh, the last official master plan we have that was created as a whole master plan is from 1994. We did do an update in 2011 and 2012, right. um, but that's the most recent master planning effort we have. I think it makes sense to put the, the exit 35 study under the master plan. It would, it should integrate into that anyway. Well, what's the difference between a planning study and creating a master plan? This is far more specific. Sorry, it keeps highlighting Egypt Road. Okay. This is far more specific and for just one portion of the town. Um, it but would it, be- It would go deeper though. Yeah, and, and I think- you may have some more at the end, a more concrete list of, hey, we should do this, 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 and this. Exactly. But Whereas for just of a master plan, maybe isn't going to have a lot of specific, this is what we need to do. Yeah, I think that the master plan will have recommendations for development for the future, but that it will be more broad over housing, open space, uh, economic development. Um, 
and various other chapters that master plans include. The other option, I talked to Peggy Sloan from Percog about this. We could do um, just funding for the economic uh, development portion of the master plan. Um, we could kind of break the master plan into piecemeal pieces instead of taking it on, taking it on all at once. My concern with the master plan is that, you know, having been involved with the update in 2011, 2012, and knowing the scale and scope and, and, and amount of time that took, that the creation of a master plan is going to be all consuming and it's going to be, you will have very, you personally, Hannah Davis, will have very little else, other time to, to do anything. Yeah. Um, and again, I, you know, maybe that's, it, it's, it's, Brian's in charge of staff allocation, time and responsibilities, but I'll tell you, a master plan is a lot. And unless there's funds to hire a more than very part-time consultant, it makes me worried that it's it's just way too much. That's me. If they, if you can hire a half time consultant to help, that's great. But I don't think that kind of money is available unless you're aching to do a master plan, Hannah. And then if you are, have at it. <laughs> I don't think that I have the expertise to write a master plan for the town of Waitley. I think that we would be contracting with Furcog. Um, or that's, other... a, that's very part-time stuff. They're not, they don't have the staff and I, I don't want to speak for Linda, but they don't have the capacity to, to, to donate, to devote a half of a full-time person to this. And that's what it takes to do it right. Cause we don't have the volunteerism these days in town. Mm. And the yeah. Last and time we did it was a lot of volunteer effort. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's me, though. I mean, Fred and Joyce can. Yeah, I'm not sure I would have put it the same way as John did, but I, when I look at those creation of a master plan, it seems very nebulous, and maybe it's like something that will help us way in the future. But we really know we want to get some economic development going near Exit 35. Yeah, and. Uh, so if we if we had to pick two, so I there was another question I was going to ask you, but if we had to pick two, I would pick the second two, and maybe that's short sighted of me, um, but that's um, that's what I think at the moment. Uh, and I guess my other question to you was going to be, how comfortable are you putting in three projects where you'll write the expression of interests and. Um, you won't necessarily have our input before the due date. Um, yeah, I think that yeah. um, especially since this is my first time around, it would be great to have your input. Um, uh -huh. I think it just depends on uh, how strongly you feel about these project ideas or any others um, that you might consider. Yeah. So, hmm. I mean, because my thought was also, well, this is your first year. Mm -hmm. Should I mean, we, and you just showed us all these other expressions of interest that you're you're sending in. It might be um, better to focus on two than try and bust your butt. I'm mean, not your butt, not my butt, your butt. <laughs> bust your butt to make that February fourth deadline. I mean, if it was my first time teaching something, I would want as much input as I could get from other people and because I teach for a living. And I, I, I imagine it's not that different in your field when you're doing something you've never done before. You ask for lots of uh, input from other people. So and I think that's that's a wise thing to do. Okay. Right. And I know you'll get lots of input from Brian and folks at Town Hall, but it, it February 4th is going to be here geez, I, I'm writing a quiz tomorrow that's going to be given on February 4th. So it's like, <laughs> it's practically here. Yeah. Um, yeah, so that's true. That, that, I, that I was one of the things I was thinking. Yeah. The last update, I do not, do not know what is involved, but from what Jonathan describes it as, I think that that is what should be set aside, that we don't have the resources to do it in any case. 
Okay. It's not at this time. Yeah, no problem. Um, like Joyce said, I think input would be really great too. So um, if you're willing to only submit two projects, I'm more than happy to do that. And I'm more than happy to focus on the exit 35 economic planning study and the water main loop closure and paving of Egypt Road. Okay, good. I think that's just the sense of the board and we don't need any further conversation. Yeah. Yeah. All okay. right. Great. That sounds Thank good. You. Thank um, you. If, Hannah, are you DLTA as well? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, pivoting a little bit, uh, FERCOG has once again received district local technical assistance. Um, this is just something to keep on your radars. I've already reached out to the boards and committees to let them know. I again sent um, a reminder email today saying that uh, I'm requesting their prioritization for projects a week from today. Um, Brian and I will put together the first best draft that we can, and of course, bring it to you guys, um, simply because FERCOG is asking for a first draft before their uh, imposed due date of January 28th. That is, um, that That's is close before, too. sorry? That's close too. <laughs> yes, that is close too. And it is before our next select board meeting. Um, mm -hmm. So I reached out and asked for an extension. They said that they would be willing to give us one if we gave them a first draft first. So, um, we're just going to give them what we can, and then you guys can provide your input, and we can give them the official draft after the next select board meeting. Okay. Okay. Um, is that closed conversation then? Are we good? Anybody have any thoughts? I've nope. got nothing. Sounds good. That sounds okay. like a good way to proceed. Okay. Um, zoning bylaws uh, submitted uh, amendments to zoning bylaws submitted by John Baronis. Brian? That is actually also me. <laughs> Last one, though. <laughs> why, Brian, why do we pay you again? <laughs> Just a pretty face on Zoom. That's it. Yeah. And, and to administer ARPA money for. <laughs> exactly. That's right. <laughs> um. Yes, so John Baronis has submitted a request for a zoning change. I will share my screen one more time. Um, all I am requesting from the select board is that we forward this on to the um, planning board. Um, we refer the petition to the planning board that requires a vote. Um, and we are required to do that per Massachusetts general law. Uh, I'll make a motion to forward this to, what did you say, planning board, Hannah? Mm -hmm. Yeah, planning board. Second. All those in favor, Fred? Aye. Joyce? Aye. Me, yes. Okay, perfect. And that is all for me. Hannah, is, there a, is there a deadline for when they need to take that up by or no? I don't know off the top of my head. Um, I think they have 65 days to hold a public hearing. Okay. Oh. And then I, I assume we're, I assume this would line up for the annual town meeting, a vote. Um, the planning board has the authority to, to give a report. It doesn't have the authority to, you know, put it through or not. Um, it's a zoning mm -hmm. petition that's filed by a landowner. So um, I think town council will tell us that it needs to go on the warrant for a vote. Okay. Okay. That all seems reasonable. Okay. Um, appointment, reappointment of Rick Adamchuk as the Whitley Animal Control Officer for calendar year 2022. That move that we reappoint Rick Adamchak as the Whitley Animal Control Officer for calendar year Second. 2022. All those in favor, Joyce. Aye. Fred. Aye. Me, yes. Thank you, Adam, uh, Rick. Thank, Thank you, Rick, Rick. Adamchak. Um, 2022 mileage reimbursement rate, Brian, IRS is... Uh, 58 and a half cents for 2022. It has historically been our practice to uh, approve and, and mirror what the IRS uses as their uh, mileage reimbursement rate. I don't see any personally any reason to change that. Anybody else have any comments? No. no. I'll, uh, make, I'll make a motion to um, set the calendar year 2022 mileage reimbursement rate to reflect that same rate uh, designated by the IRS. Second. All those in favor, Fred. 
Aye. Joyce. Aye. Me, yes. Town administrator update, Brian. <clears throat> Your what favorite you part. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yes. Um, I had emailed out to the board uh, an email that I had received from Eversource, um, and it was concerning cold weather events and um, how municipalities should prepare for cold weather events in the case of, um, let's say that there's a lack of electricity. Um, and I had forwarded that to our uh, state representative and senator, and they kind of ran with it because it was really, I think, the first time that they had heard about you know, the, those contingency plans. Um, and, uh, apparently it, it really got a lot of people noticing what's happening. Eversource got a lot of complaints, uh, I guess a lot of inquiries as to, as to what, what's, what's going on. Um, and of course, like, like a good utility, they, they passed the buck to somebody else. Oh, uh, I didn't say that. Um, which, which by the way, I'm going to, I'm going to put in there, Brian, which is absolutely Correct. I mean, I'm not one to defend utilities very often, I know. but this is an ISO New England issue. There's no question. This is an ISO New England issue, and we need to raise the raise this to to, to them because EverSource is just right doing what they're told to do. So I don't really know where to where to go with this. I I mean, I have a fee. I don't know enough about ISO New England and how it's structured and what it controls and what it doesn't control and who it reports to and who it doesn't report to. Um, and we tend to not pay attention when things go well. And then when things go bad, we always kind of say, oh, wait, what's going on here? And maybe we should have been paying attention earlier to something. Um, and I mm -hmm. feel like this is kind of we should pay attention to it. Uh, it's the first time, at least since I've been here, that I've that I've heard of the, these possibilities. Um, and it kind of made me question sort of what's the process here and, and yeah. who, who, who are they accountable to? Yeah. And then what, like, what is our obligation to notify residents in town that this could be happening? Um, that's one of the things that I thought about, you know, even in Texas, they can prioritize public safety, right. And prioritize the electric power getting to places like public safety complexes. And that I only know because I have a son living in Texas who, who managed to get through all of their last winter problems um, because he's lives right next to a public safety complex, <laughs> which means sirens a lot, but hey, it meant he, he was on the line that got electric power. That to me, that was the biggest concern here was that they, that this was, you know, they, they were not going to be, paying attention to if we're going to do rolling brownouts, everybody gets some public safety included. And I'm like, right. We, that's what we need when the power goes out is to have our public safety unavailable anymore. Um, you know, like, like the very least skims ought to be able to <laughs> be able to operate. So to me, that was a big thing. Well, I, I, maybe I missed something, but I'm still scratching my head as to why this is suddenly an issue in 2022, in the winter of 2022, when it has, it never rose to this level, or maybe they were just going to do it without anyone, letting anyone know in previous winters. Well, has anything changed? I don't think so. Is, is, is supply chain impacting energy volatility? I don't think so. I thought they said it was that they didn't have enough fuel or they didn't think they had enough. Yeah, that was in one of the letters. Depending on the demand. But, but I haven't heard of, but again, what has changed in terms of our fuel supply? Yeah. It's not getting colder, it's getting warmer. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it, right. You know, Maybe they just want everybody to get upset. So the next thing they ask for, we just say yes to. Yeah. Like I mean, a pipeline? Yankee Row, went, Yankee Row went offline how many years ago? And they were able to, 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 to find replacement fuel for that. Um, I don't understand why this is all of a sudden 
an issue? And, and, is it, and is it truly a concern? I guess is my other question. I mean, yes, it's a concern if they're serious, but is this really not going to happen? I, I, I'll second what Brian said, though. We don't even really know who or what ISO New England is, who they answer to, and what they're responsible for. They're responsible, Every, for, they're responsible for the delivery, the, 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 putting the fuel onto the grid to make sure the grid operates safely, yeah. securely. They're the grid operator. Yeah. Yeah, they're the grid operator. The, the, yeah. the, the way energy works in Massachusetts is that utilities are simply a wires company. Right. They're not responsible for source. ISO New England is responsible for source. ISO New England is, is responsible for planning where we are going to get in proportionality mm -hmm. all of our energy needs, our electricity supply needs. Who they answer to, I would imagine they answer to the regulatory authorities at the executive level, but I don't know that for certain. But they are responsible for our electricity generation. Yeah. So yeah. I, I wonder yeah. if we need to invite yeah. someone from ISO New England to an upcoming meeting. May I say something? Absolutely, Amy. Um, ISO New England, they're in charge of transmission, not generation. Trans, I'm sorry, I meant transmission. I apologize. Yes, you're yeah, right. Yeah, they're not in charge of generating the power. They're in charge of the transmission of the power to the grids, which is in turn um, a resource or whoever's job to uh, distribute that to right. the houses. Right, I apologize. If, if, their, if their job is transmission, what are, why is their concern the fuel? If they're just transmitting the energy that is electricity is being generated by whoever's responsible for the generation. I would have to look at the email again. I just skimmed it over very briefly this morning when I came in. So I'm not familiar with what their concerns are without looking at it further. But I just wanted to correct that they're not in charge of generation. They're just in charge of transmission. <coughs> Yeah, but I think they call for power from the various sources um, that they that right. they have. Right, so like the, the pricing the plant so, or whatever yeah. generates it, and then ISO New England is in charge of the transmission right. to the distribution centers. Right, but if the problem is a fuel problem, that's going to be a generation. Right, but but you can't yeah. be the one who who provides the transmission and and basically controls the grid without being aware of what sources do you have available, how much capacity do you have available in terms of generation, <clears throat> um, and when do you put which sources online? Um, well, but it sounds like another opportunity to pass the buck to whoever they are buying the power from right. that they so are transmitting. It wouldn't hurt us to get a little more well. Um, you know, I, under, to understand better what ISO New England does. Let's bring somebody so in. I, I, I agree that having somebody come to an upcoming meeting and bring in our questions then uh, would be good. Because I think that's a, that's a really good question to put to them. Hey, what do you care? Your transmission, why are you worried about fuel? And they might be able to say, well, this is why we worry about fuel. Then give a better answer than I did. I just think we need to have a better idea of how the whole system works and who's responsible for what yeah. and who they are responsible to. <laughs> right. And who thought of this system anyway? <laughs> um, you know, ISO New England has a public affairs office. Okay, we'll reach out. Um, <clears throat> so it was recommended that we talk about uh the status of all of the uh, marijuana establishments that have uh host community agreements with the town um some of these have um are not active anymore some of them are we don't really know what's going on and then some of them are active 
Um, so there's been one, two, three, four. I think 11 host community agreements at this point. Um, the only one that's operating at this point is DMCTC. It's a cultivation facility at Severn River Road. Um, they're the only ones that have gotten all the way through the process and have a final uh, final cultivation license with the CCC. Um, Green Jeans Co-op, That's a, there's an application pending for cultivation at 149 Christian Lane. Um, and then Wait, Waitley Cultivation Partners, that's um, the greenhouses on State Road. That's the host community agreement that was recently signed with um, to replace what was formerly uh, NAP advisors. Um, we don't. I I don't know what's what's happening with the the Diamond Shine proposal um, at eighty five State Road. Um, I will check. I will try to get in contact with the applicant again. Um, but at this point. Um, the HCA has lapsed for that project. Mm -hmm. um, and then NAP Advisors, the host community agreement has lapsed for that one. And then also for Urban Grown, which was the original applicant for 140, uh, 149 Christian Lane that obviously we know that project's not moving forward. Yeah. Um, is provisional is below application pending, right? Like final is you've made it through. <clears throat> The next level is application pending, and then provisional is lower than that. Is that yeah? Um, provisional, that right? the provisional is like a preliminary license. It's the term for oh. um, we pretty much approved you, but now you need to go through our inspection process. Oh, okay, so application <laughs> pending is kind of the lowest level, right? Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. Good. Um, as, as so, so the project that was originally proposed for twenty three was South Drive. That's no longer, that's no longer being pursued. Yeah. Um, <coughs> the other one, DMCTC, is on River Road for cultivation, manufacturing, retail would be at four twenty four State Road, in the Red Building. Um, mm -hmm. Green Jeans Co op at one forty nine Christian Lane. That that application's pending. And AP Advisors is it's. We know what happened there. They're they're no longer pursuing the to be the operator. The so greenhouse. Four twenty four State Road would be in the gray building, not the red building. <clears throat> uh, they both share the same address, I believe. Okay, but you said the red building. That's Toro Verde. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, DMCTC is the gray building. Toro Verde is the red building. Okay. Yep. Urban Grown is no longer. I, neither of those projects are are going forward. Um. So that's really the status. Okay. It's it's not the it delays have been attributed, I think, to the CCC and the applicants. I think the town has done a, a really good job in terms of the select board moving through the HCA process and in the ZBA and the planning board moving through their permitting processes. I, I think the town has done a yeah. really good job in, in processing this. It's it's either the private market or the CCC that has really slowed these down. So yeah. so something like half are active we got six active and then we've got five that are either terminated or inactive so okay. if somebody asks hey you got a 50 50 chance <laughs> of uh, being alive after mm, five years the ccc and, needs more representation from rural massachusetts mm, yeah because they don't understand Okay. I really thought this was a nice chart, by the way. So whoever's yes, idea was you. and whoever put it together, two thumbs up. Fred's idea, uh, my chart. Okay. I think well, it was I, Fred's I, idea. I, I'll give the credit 60 40 then, huh? <laughs> Which way? No, just kidding. Um, <laughs> 80 20 to Brian. <laughs> um, I just wanted to talk quickly about the, the Mass DOT's 25% design hearing that, that we had on Haydenville Road. It was last Wednesday. Uh, Mass DOT presented the project, um, and I thought it went it fairly well. There was, you know, some of better concerns about about driveways and about you know what their frontage would look like. And I know uh, there was one of butter who had expressed concerns about loss of trees. And I know that Keith went out there the the following morning and had had a discussion about um, some some possible modifications to the project. So I think I appreciate Keith for doing that as well. Yeah, I, I want to give a, a congratulations to Keith 
for stepping up and just volunteering to be the public face for the town and that he will be the liaison with homeowners with issues. Yeah. Yeah. And again, I mean, for this project, it's a 1.5 mile, you know, um, reconstruction of Haydenville Road from the town line to um, the bridge right before Conway Road. Yes, Conway Road. Yeah, near yeah. Conway uh, and Westbrook Road there, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, um, and I had misspoke during the hearing. Uh, Fred had pointed this out to me and also uh, somebody else emailed me and checked my math, but the cost of the project is 100 times our chapter nine annual chapter 90 allocation. So, oh. um it would take us a, a century to pay for that. It would take us not a, a decade, not and, a decade. And it should be pointed out that if we just do patchwork like it's been happening, um, you're throwing good money after bad. It's not fiscally responsible to just to, to just do patchwork, and it will prevent us from doing other things that are important with Chapter 90 funds. And you continue to have runoff into the Northampton Reservoir. Right. Yeah, and not Number to mention. Right. the safety improvements to the roadway in terms of compliant mm -hmm. guardrails and adding guardrail guardrails where they really need to be added instead of maybe the three quarters of the cement posts that were originally installed to mm -hmm. attack those guardrails are there um so it, it's they're, they're they're this way they're not this yeah. way anymore they're this way somebody's already hit them yeah um so that project is still, you know, it's, it's still, for, it would be funded for the, from the, from the tip for the transportation improvement project, uh, transportation improvement plan. That's federal highway money that's administered by the uh, Franklin Transportation Planning Organization, which is staffed by FERCOG. That's currently uh, programmed for funding in uh, fiscal year 2025. So we, we should be on track um, to receive that funding and construct in 20, 2025. And a portion of those costs would also have to be what's called advanced construction. We would also be using some, we'd actually be borrowing against FY26 tip money to pay for the remainder of our project because the region gets about, I think it's around eight or $9 million. So we would take up a full year of of the region's funding for that. And then we'd have a little bit of the, the next year, but um, we're on track for that. So um, I think I think it went quite well. Unless anyone forget, that's only two years away. Yeah. It's right around the corner. Yep, I just and I just wanted to mention the wait we have uh, 250th parade participation forms are on the website, um, and they're asking those to be returned on <coughs> May 1st by May 1st. Um, we're looking uh, the next topic of uh, Whitley Town Hall windows. When we originally had windows installed as part of the historic rehabilitation project, there was about half of them made from a certain from a certain manufacturer that that quickly developed this pink, a pink sheen, essentially pink spotting. Um, and we were told from the, the, the builder that it was essentially a, a delamination of the glass. Um, and those were replaced immediately when we saw them. And there's on the, on some of the windows, and I think some of them are the replacement windows, we're starting to see that again. Um, the warranty on those windows goes, should go through, well, it does go through the spring of 2023. So we're going to be looking to get you know, those replaced as well under the warranty, but um, it's, it's a problem that seems to be appearing again. So we're gonna look into addressing that. Um, mm -hmm. Folks should have received uh, an email from Amy LaValle about annual town reports, um, asking those to be submitted by January 28th. Um, and everybody's generally on time with those, right? Oh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> way on time um um so south county senior center so um uh, there's a survey that's going to be going out for a senior needs assessment um folks may have already received postcards so it's being sent out to residents over yeah. the age of uh, uh 50 and older um so maybe some folks have started receiving postcards and then they'll also receive um they'll also receive a copy of the survey um, and also an online link to do that uh, survey online. So it's again, it's a senior needs assessment and it's really to gather information about, about what people want uh, in terms of you know, a new South County Senior Center. Um, programs and activities, facilities, all those types of things as we, as we sort of look towards the future as to 
what that center's, senior center is going to be and what it's going to offer. Um, so be on the lookout for that. And there'll also be a link that we'll put up on the on the town website to the survey as well. Um, and I would, Brian, I would add, please respond to that, even if you are not someone who's ever imagined utilizing senior center services. Um, this is about expanding so that it, it's not the same services that senior centers historically are known for. Not to say that those services would go away, but what else can we do um, to, to make a senior center more of a an attractive uh, vehicle for seniors to utilize without the stigma that some people have for a senior center. So every, everyone should re respond, because by the way, everyone's gonna be over 50 someday. Um, and then we just wanted to let you know that two grants that the town receives, um, one is a fiscal year 2022 firefighter safety equipment grant, I was um, ten thousand. We'll go five hundred dollars. We'll add a dollar in there. Um, ten thousand four hundred ninety-nine dollars, and that's going to pay for uh, some turnout gear and communications equipment. And then there was a small grant through the volunteer firefighter assistance grant of twenty-eight hundred dollars, and that's going to uh, purchase some protective shirts um, and equipment for uh, forest fires. I guess they're called wildland fires, but I don't think we have too many wildlands out here. Um, so those are just two smaller grants that the town had received recently. Um, yeah. but those pale in comparison to the ones Hannah will get. So, um, <laughs> Brian, do those supplement any monies that have been given for equipment or would that, because I know they've gotten, the fire department's gotten some grants for equipment or not some funding for equipment. In their um, budget, I, you mean? Um, yeah, I'm not sure what, I guess I'm not, I guess I don't understand the question though. The, I mean, we, the, the town has funded firefighting equipment for the fire yeah. department. Is this supplemental to that or does this in some cases uh, replace some of the money that the town has funded? Um, so it's really in addition to that, I think. Okay. Um, so, I mean, the turnout gear, it's essentially, I, I think it's essentially one new set of gear. We found out a couple of years ago that to much to our surprise, the gear's, the gear's good for about 10 years. Um, if you remember that fun yeah. finance committee meeting. Um, so presumably it, it's one, you know, one pair less that we'll have to purchase at, at that time because um, it's kind of off cycle. And the other one is, um, I think it's actually a match. So, so it's going to pay 50% of. Okay. Of I was just yeah. curious where, what the status of the funds was. Yep. So I think that's, I think that's it. Okay. All right. Anybody else have anything to add? Nope. Not me. I would move that we adjourn then, please. I would second. All those in favor, Joyce. Aye. Fred. Aye. Me, yes. Thanks, everybody. Aye. Good night. Good night, everybody. Good night. Thanks. Thank Have you. a nice evening.